local stories, local solutions. Welcome everyone. My name is Kale Black and I serve as the Senior Program Coordinator at Burlington Green and I am honored to serve as the MC for this evening's event. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for what we hope will be an informative, engaging, and empowering experience for everyone. Before we get started, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Burlington, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, our land spanning from Lake Ontario to the Niagara Escarpment are steeped in Indigenous history. The territory is mutually covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy, the Ojibwe, and other allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. So, some instruction. To support a smooth flowing experience for everyone, I'd like to briefly run through a few technical considerations. Our event should last approximately 90 minutes. We have muted the participant lines to improve sound quality, and we ask that you keep your cameras off until we start the Q&A portion of the evening. If you move your cursor or mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat icon, which you can use to submit a question directly to the panelists or share a comment with the whole group. For technical assistance, select the co-host Sue in the chat and your message will go directly to her. You can submit a question anytime for the Q&A portion by sending a chat message to Sue. And you can see she just popped in a message right underneath there that says, that's me, tech help. So hopefully that helps you uh, to find her if you have any questions or need any assistance throughout the evening. We are going to be addressing as many of your questions as we can at the end of the meeting during the time for discussion and Q&A. There will also be an opportunity for you to ask questions directly with your mic and camera on if you wish. We will be sharing some useful links and resources with you tonight and we'll follow up after tonight's meeting with an email that will include all of the links that we've shared tonight throughout the presentation. You can relax and simply enjoy and know that everything that we share this evening is going to be sent right to your inboxes in a nice user-friendly package. Please note, we are also recording this meeting. Tonight, we're going to be using the poll feature. When the poll appears on your screen, use your mouse to select the option you prefer. I will make sure to give you a friendly prompt just before we close each poll. Let's give it a try before we move on with a review of this evening's agenda. Kelly, can you please launch the poll? And if everyone can please use your cursor to make your selection, I will give you an opportunity to vote now. Fantastic, I'll give you guys about five more seconds. It's a very good question. Why are you here? Fantastic, I'll give you guys about five more seconds and then, wonderful. Kelly, can you please close the poll and display the results? Fantastic, so as you guys can see, because uh, hopefully you can all see the poll results, uh, the most common answer is that I have some climate knowledge and I want to be better at discussing it with others. Amazing, and um, I know that you're going to get what you came here this evening to receive. We got a fantastic presentation for you. So let's get underway. Joining me tonight as presenters are some of the members of our Burlington Green team and Burlington residents, Paul and Melissa Fletcher. This evening's event is inspired by Al Gore's Climate Reality Project where individuals who have become trained as climate reality leaders go on to share what they've learned along with their own climate stories with, where, with the communities where they live. 
Most of the Burlington Green team members received the training this summer, and we've all come together to prepare what we hope will be a rewarding experience for all of you tonight. We've designed this evening's event to take you on somewhat of a journey. We'll begin with a global snapshot of how climate change is impacting so many populations that we share this one and only home with. We'll also look at some of the exciting solutions that are already taking place, making a positive difference. Then we'll move on to take a look at Canada and the impacts and solutions nationwide before coming home here to Burlington, where we hope you will all discover something new about the climate impacts that we're experiencing right now, as well as some of the solution efforts that are currently underway. Then, We'll move on to be inspired by the Fletcher family as they share their story. You'll discover more about Burlington Green with some helpful tips shared by our executive director, Amy, who also has some exciting news to share. Peppered throughout the presentations will be some team member video stories, an important message from local youth, and again, some polls that we'd love for you to participate in. So, let's begin. First up is BG team member, Kayla. Let's first hear her message of what inspires her to take action on climate change. While I am continually inspired to live more green, as I learn more about nature and ecosystems and the interconnectedness of our planet, I was initially inspired by my dad, who was a huge animal and nature lover. He instilled in my brother and I at a very young age the importance of protecting our planet. Now this passion passed down to me has really shaped how I see the world and how I interact in that world. And I feel the responsibility to speak up for those without a voice and to elevate the voices that are too often ignored. Sometimes I think to myself, we take so much from this earth, but what do we give it back in return? Now, while I might not always like that answer, I know that humans are capable of change. I know that it's possible. And it's that possibility that inspires me and gives me hope. Thank you, Kale. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to kick things off with the global story of climate change, facts, and solutions. First things first, how is our climate changing? I'm sure we've all heard the term global warming or climate change but some of us might not be aware of the process of how this happens. Essentially, our planet is warmed by the sun's light energy. This energy, called solar radiation, passes through our atmosphere and is absorbed by the Earth's various surfaces, including forests, oceans, pavements, buildings, ice sheets, and more. Some of this light energy reflects back into space. However, some of this outgoing solar radiation is caught within our atmosphere, causing the atmosphere and Earth to warm. While this typically is a good function that helps to keep our planet livable and sustain life, humans are adding an abundance of harmful greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane into that very thin shell of atmosphere. And this is accelerating global temperatures. We are spewing more than 150 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into that very thin shell of atmosphere every day. So what are humans doing that is causing the climate to warm? Well, there is a lot that we are doing that is disrupting the natural environment. Soil degradation from poor farming practices deforestation of old growth forests to plant monocultures, oftentimes for animal feed or palm oil plantations. Transportation, landfills which emit carbon dioxide and methane, livestock activities that produce potent greenhouse gases and rely on transportation as well as other natural resources like water and wheat for animal feed, the burning of fossil fuels, all of these human activities contribute greatly to the amount of greenhouse gases we're pumping into our planet, and this is drastically altering life as we know it. We see increased heat waves and health impacts in cities and increased wildfires as a result. We see declining water supplies, which is causing conflict in some parts of the world as water is becoming a more and more scarce resource. 
flooding and erosion in coastal areas, coral, coral bleaching and acidification, species endangerment directly related to human interference, and we are seeing more destructive natural disasters that are creating climate refugees too, creating more social and economic tensions. So there are definitely a lot of trickle down issues of climate change beyond environmental impacts. As a result of climate change, we have seen extreme weather events on a global scale. This is in Guadalajara, Mexico in June of last year, where five feet of hell, hail fell overnight. These heavy downpours of precipitation are on the rise as our climate continues to warm. We are witnessing extreme precipitation events that lead to flooding, mudslides, and other events. This was in Japan last year, where more than a million people were advised to evacuate. In the past two decades, the world's 10 worst floods have caused more than $165 billion in damage and have driven more than 1 billion people from their homes. By 2050, flooding is projected to inundate coastal cities an average of 40 times more often than the present day. Even though we are seeing unpredictable precipitation patterns in many parts of the globe, we are also seeing extreme drought occur as well. Scientists have used tree ring data to reconstruct the last 1200 years of drought in Central and Southern California's history. Only three other droughts in this massive timescale have come close to the current drought and none were as bad. With temperatures rising and rainfall increasingly unpredictable, we are seeing more forest fires and they're growing in size, intensity and duration. Wildfires are most often the result of human activity, stemming from debris burning, arson, campfires, and fireworks, all made more dangerous under drier conditions. Likewise, we saw last year the devastating bushfires in Australia that killed and displaced nearly 3 billion animals. The WWF commissioned a report in which scientists concluded it was one of the worst wildlife disasters in modern history. Like I said earlier, Climate change is much more than strictly an environmental issue. We need to recognize that these events disproportionately affect marginalized groups, including minorities, black and indigenous communities, poverty stricken individuals and communities, and vulnerable geographic locations like low lying coastal regions. However, there are individuals and communities taking a stand against the impacts of climate change and implementing solutions. Contrary to popular belief, not every solution is as difficult and time or resource intensive as we might think. Take a look at these examples of climate heroes and how they are uniquely defying the odds and setting examples for us in the Western world. In places like Sierra Leone, Africa, one of the poorest countries in the world, communities are utilizing solar energy. 87% of Sierra Leone's 7.65 million people lack access to a reliable electricity grid. So in efforts for people to have access to digital information, more and more communities are harnessing solar energy. And did you know that in a single hour, the amount of power from the sun that strikes the earth is more than the energy that the entire world consumes in a year. There's definitely a lot of energy to harness and we need to start utilizing it on a global scale. You may have heard this story before about Jadav Payeng, known as the forest man of India. Jadav has spent the last 30 odd years planting trees in the once threatened Malau Katoni forest. He planted trees over 100 over 1,400 acres, which is comparable to 15 football stadiums. Trees are a wonderful combatant against climate change. Capturing or sequestering carbon is their forte, and they are wonderful at helping to regulate air temperature. Do you ever walk into a forest and feel the temperature suddenly become cool? That is what we like to call nature's AC. In addition, trees are excellent at absorbing excess amounts of water to help in flood prevention, while also serving as habitat 
for various animal and other plant species, helping ecosystems to maintain rich biodiversity. There are many more significant advancements tackling climate change around the world, but I'll leave it with these as we break for a quick poll before moving on to the Canadian story. Wonderful. So as Kayla had just mentioned, it is time for another poll. So Kelly, can you please launch our next poll? Wonderful. You guys can see the question. So I will give you a few moments to fill out our poll. I'll give you guys about 10 more seconds. All right, five more seconds. I know my counting was way off. There's only two more. Okay, beautiful. Kelly, can you close down the poll and show us the results? Amazing. So most of you guys were correct and the answer is 97%. So 90% of scientists agree that humans are the cause of climate change. Now over to Marwa. But first we are going to share a brief video on Marwa's climate story and what inspires her to take action on climate. My climate story is shaped by my life experience. I'm a mother, an immigrant, and an environmental professional. When my husband and I were planning our small family's future, we chose Canada for its abundant nature and beauty. I moved halfway across the world to lay down new roots and establish a more sustainable and greener life. That journey motivates me and drives my environmental passion. I've been fortunate enough to experience nature in all its glory, from desert dune to tropical rainforest, the scale and beauty of nature is humbling. Working on the front lines of environmental community engagement, I experienced firsthand the local impacts of climate change, the risks and the rewards, and the need for my community to come together in the face of the climate crisis. What we do now will have a lasting effect for decades to come. This is the defining moment of my generation. Thanks, Kayla. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Canadians across the country have felt the impacts of climate change in recent years and will continue to do so, be it extreme weather events, escalating insurance premiums, or higher inflation, climate change affects our lives on a daily basis. This is the change in annual temperatures and rainfall in Canada since 1950. Between 1948 and 2012, Temperatures increased approximately 1.7 degrees. The most significant warming occurred over northern and western Canada and was most evident in spring and winter temperatures. Heavy downpours in Canada followed the same trend and the average annual rainfall has shown an upward tr trend in the last several decades. This is an example of damage caused by flooding in Montreal. Extreme weather events like this and others have caused devastation and incurred catastrophic losses, changing the landscape of the insurance industry in Canada. Sometimes the issue is not too much rain, rather not enough rain, such as the drought experienced in the prairies between 1999 and 2004, which was said to be one of the most severe droughts in 100 years. The average amount of land burned has also doubled since the 1970s, this is attributed to increasing temperatures and decreased rainfall due to climate change. In May of 2016, a raging wildfire forced a mass evacuation of some 88,000 people from Fort McMurray in Alberta and caused several billion dollars worth of damages, making it the costliest disaster in Canadian history at the time. Smoke from the wildfire traveled more than 4,000 miles. Climate change comes with a heavy bill. Costs for Canada could escalate from roughly $5 billion per year in 2020 to between 21 billion and up to $43 billion per year by the 2050s. But there is hope. Technology advances, political will, and community action 
and shift the tide and reduce the implications of climate change. Solar capacity and investments have taken off in Canada over the last decade, with investments in solar installations reaching $2.8 billion in 2014. Installed wind power has also increased dramatically since 2000, with the wind power capacity currently at more than 13,000 megawatts. A 2014 report by Clean Energy Canada found that more people work in clean energy jobs than in the oil sands. The report also found that clean energy jobs were growing incredibly fast. 37% more Canadians worked in the renewable energy industry in 2013 than in 2009. Vancouver is a great example. With a population of 600,000 people, the city has committed to running on 100% renewable energy for electricity, heating, and cooling within 20 years and clean transportation by 2050. So what is Canada doing at the federal level? In 2016, Canada formally ratified the Paris Climate Change Agreement and committed to reducing its GHG emissions by 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. We're making some progress towards tackling climate change, but solutions with speed and scale must be implemented if we are to contribute as a country to this global crisis. As we prepare for a post-COVID future, we know that returning to normal is not an option. We must invest in a sustainable future. A green recovery for Canada means a just transition to a low carbon economy. I'll wrap up this section with a quick poll. Kelly, can you please launch the poll? I'm going to give you guys a few seconds. Okay, we have five more seconds. All right, Kelly, could you close the poll, please, and show the results? All right, well, I think we all have a mutual feeling. We need to see more action at the federal level. Thank you all for voting. I'll now pass it over to Kelly to focus on the local context. And first, you'll meet Kelly in this short video and learn what inspires her to take action on climate. My journey here really didn't begin as an environmental one. Growing up, I had a love of the outdoors, and as I got older, that evolved to a love of adventure and travel, and I've been very fortunate to have been able to visit a lot of really wonderful places around the world. And those experiences were some of the most profound and, and soul-changing ones that I've had. And while there was immense beauty, there was also immense destruction and pollution and ecosystems at risk. And the more I traveled, the more I really saw and understood just how precious our earth is. And we have to protect what we love. And I want to do that not just because I have and do enjoy exploring it so much, but because future generations also deserve to have that experience too. Thanks, Marwa, for sharing the Canadian context of climate change with us. I'm going to be bringing the conversation closer to home as I focus on the local context of climate change. First off, who is Burlington in all of this? We're a growing city in southern Ontario and the greater Toronto area. In 2016, we had a population over 183,000, and in 2019, those numbers were over 192,000. In 2018, 38% of Ontario, Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions were from transportation, and an additional 19% comes from buildings. This means that 57% of greenhouse gas emissions generated in Ontario are a result of the way we travel and how we live. 
So how does Burlington compare to the province? More specifically in Burlington, 44% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from transit, 5% are from the residential sector. This again indi indicates that 69% of greenhouse gas emissions generated in Burlington are direct result of our homes and vehicles. In Burlington, we have the highest percentage of automobile ownership per person in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. To put it simply, we have a lot of cars and we like to drive them. We're a booming waterfront city with nearly equal urban and rural areas. The majority of residents live in the urban area where we're beginning to experience something called the urban heat island effect. To explain this, natural ecosystems and rural areas are often shaded by trees and vegetation and cooled by evaporating moisture, whereas roads and building surfaces absorb and trap heat, and many buildings generate their own heat as well. So when green spaces are replaced with roads and buildings, we start to experience temperature differences between built up areas and parks, for example. That temperature difference is also likely to increase with climate change. By 2050, it is projected that our summers will increase by three degrees in the greater Toronto area. And to take a closer look at climate change in Burlington, we're forecasted to see increasingly warmer annual temperatures, increased days of ex extreme heat in summer, milder winters, and an increase in precipitation. For example, Burlington's average winter temperature is minus 3.3 degrees Celsius. And this is expected to increase by 1.3 to 1.6 degrees in as early as the 2020s. So what does warmer year-round temperatures mean for us? It means an increase in extreme heat in summer, like heat advisories, mixed precipitation in winter, like freezing rains, ice storms, and various freeze-thaw cycles, high-intensity storms with increased rainfall and flooding, high wind storms, expansion of insect-borne illnesses, and expansion of invasive species. It could also mean a decrease in water levels in Lake Ontario by 0 0.5 meters by 2050, decrease ice cover time on the lakes by one to one month, and increase in lake water temperatures, especially near shore. We've already started to see the impacts of these stream storms, like in 2013 in Toronto when it rained 12.6 centimeters in two hours, with insured property losses over eight, $850 million. Burlington experienced something similar in August 2014, where nearly two months worth of rain fell in just two and a half hours. This was flooding on the QEW in Burlington from the storm. There are over 3,000 homes flooded and 90 million in insured claims. An additional 2.6 million in claims were paid by the city's disaster relief fund. This doesn't account for property damage that wasn't covered. Our current infrastructure wasn't built with these new extreme storms in mind. Rather, they reflect the old predictable storms we were once used to. Senior climatologists with the Environment of Canada said, Canada, Canadians are facing a new breed of storm and governments should change the way they plan for this kind of wild weather that caused a flash flood in Burlington. It's, only, it's like these are bullseyes. Extreme weather includes high winds, like what we saw in March 2017 when the Skyway Bridge closed after it truck toppled over due to high wind. And in April and May of 2018, windstorms resulted in over 341,000 in cleanup costs. Extreme weather has implications for both insurance premiums and losses as well, as we've seen significant increases in insured property damage over the last 20 years. This hasn't been touched on yet today, so the spread of insect-borne illnesses are also impacted by climate change. Warming temperatures allow for mosquitoes and ticks, which can carry diseases, to expand their habitat range. Likewise, warmer temperatures can increase the number of days conducive for them to reproduce, while in some cases allowing them to reproduce faster. These insects pose a serious, health to our risk, serious risk to our human health. As we've seen this with the spread of West Nile virus from mosquitoes and Lyme disease from ticks. Ticks are an increasing concern in Ontario as Lyme disease infected ticks can transmit Lyme disease to humans. In the early 90s, the only major hotspot in Ontario for ticks was at Long Point Provincial Park. 
Since then, the population has been increasing and expanding. Invasive species also play a part in this climate story. For those who may not be familiar with the term, invasive species are essentially an organism or plant that is introduced to a new environment and is not native to a particular area. Since invasive species are not native, they're able to adapt more quickly to a changing climate than our native species. This makes it easier for invasive populations, both pest and plant, to adapt and flourish, putting our native species at risk. A local example of this is the emerald ash borer, which has and is decimating our native ash trees. Ash trees make up 13% of Burlington's tree canopy, and as of December 2018, over 2,800 ash trees were removed by the city, and these numbers don't account for trees that are being removed on private property. Despite efforts to manage the issue, eventually all ash trees will die due to insect damage. Burlington's tree canopy is currently at 15 to 17 percent, earning it a very poor mark from Conservation Halton. Maintaining our existing trees and growing the urban tree canopy is important for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Trees are a valuable resource in that they absorb carbon from the air and store the carbon in the tree itself and soil. They also combat the urban heat island effect we discussed earlier by providing shade and cooling. Trees also help to reduce peak storm water flows by absorbing water. When we reflect on these local stories and circumstances, it's clear that we're not immune to the impacts of climate change in Burlington. And while the severity of the situation is real, it's important that we also look at what has happened and is happening local to mitigate climate change. Now for the solutions. First off, a big step was taken when the city of Burlington declared a climate emergency in the spring of 2019. In April 2020, a community-based climate action plan was approved by council. The climate action plan included seven key areas to help the community transition away from the use of fossil fuels, particularly for buildings and transportation. So how are things looking now? We know that green sustainable infrastructure is important to reduce energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions. As of 2018, there are 16 buildings in Burlington that are certified through the Canada Green Buildings Council Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Of the 16, four of them are city buildings. We don't have any major renewable energy systems like wind or solar farms in Burlington. The homeowners and business owners installing solar panels increased over recent years. Since 2014, community greenhouse gas emissions have decreased by almost 200,000 tons, primarily from the residential and industrial sectors. That's equivalent to the emissions of over 42,000 passenger vehicles driven in one year. We already learned that Burlington has the highest vehicle ownership in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Though half of trips by residents in Burlington are under five kilometers, which does provide an excellent opportunity for active transportation. As of 2018, there are over 212 kilometers of cycling facilities, which include bike lanes, multi-use paths, signed routes, and paved shoulders. A recent search found that Burlington has 114 public electric vehicle charging stations, 27 of them were installed by the city. Park areas in Burlington increased by 3.3% since 2014 too. In partnership with local charities like Burlington Green, Conservation Halton, and other local businesses, over 37,000 native trees, shrubs, and grasses have been planted in Burlington since 2013. Likewise, the city also introduced a private tree bylaw in January 2020 which requires residents obtain a permit before cutting a down a tree on their property of a certain size. There are many environmental benefits of growing your own food. It's organic, pesticide free, and has not been transported across the country, the continent, or the world in many cases. There are over 200 community garden plots in five parks across Burlington, and these numbers don't include additional community gardens on private properties like faith lands or schools. I'll end this part of the presentation with another poll. And if everyone can use your cursor to make your selection, I'll give you an opportunity to vote.
and I'll give you guys just a few more seconds to put your response in. Ooh, it's a really close call. Just a few more left. I'll give you five more seconds. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share those results. So interestingly, natural solutions like more trees and green spaces are what people are most excited about. But, you know, green transit wasn't far behind and community gardens and bike friendly communities got a few too. Thanks, guys. So we're going to be sharing some local stories next. But first, we'll watch a video from Kale on what inspires him to take action on climate. I'm passionate about taking action on climate change for these three reasons. Love, knowledge, and opportunity. The reason that I say love first is because it's my primary motivational factor. So whether it's love for my family, my friends, my community, my favorite animals, turtles, or my favorite foods to eat, my favorite music to listen to, I know that I'm only able to enjoy those things thanks to the very delicate and intricate ecosystems that allow life to thrive on our planet. The knowledge that human activity is putting a lot of those ecosystems at risk and has already compromised so many of them uh, gives a very natural lift to inspiration to protect the things that you care about. And I feel like the opportunity aspect is so important to mention because in Canada, we're very lucky. We're free to use our voices and to take action in ways that people in different parts of the planet are not. Hey everyone, that was me. <laughs> um, checking in to see how everyone is doing how we are enjoying this evening so far. We have covered quite a bit and recognize that it is a lot of information to take in. Our hope is that by learning about the facts and realities of climate change globally, nationally, and here at home, everyone will be better equipped to begin or further ramp up their individual actions on climate change. And while the challenge is huge, and there is so much work that needs to be done by all of us acting now to address climate, biodiversity, human health, and social justice crises. Learning about efforts that are being carried out by people right here in Burlington is exactly the inspiration we need right now more than ever before. We wish we had time tonight to shine a bright light on many of those inspirational people in the community, but in the interest of time, we could not be more thrilled to have the wonderful Fletcher family join us tonight to share their climate story with us. I am so pleased to hand it over to Melissa and Paul. Thank you, Kale. Uh, thanks so much for having us. It's an honor to be joining you here tonight. Um, so first, let's talk about why our family cares about climate change. So like many people, we're concerned about the future that we're leaving for our children. We have a sense of guilt that we as humans have caused such destruction of our natural world and we feel compelled to make reparations. We were assuming that politicians were already taking care of this problem and it wasn't something that we as individuals really needed to be worried about. Canada has actually been talking about the climate crisis for decades, but our country has been setting targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions since the early 1990s and unfortunately has not met any climate target that it has set. At the start, the whole idea seemed very much out of reach. After all, what can one household really do to combat something as big as climate change? We're not scientists or politicians, but the good news is scientists have already figured out exactly what we need to do. Meaningful changes can start at home and they're a lot easier than you might think. It's now up to us to do it and encourage our politicians to act as well. So our climate action really began back in 2018 when we decided to buy a 100% electric vehicle. 
So we had learned that around 38% of Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions were being caused by the transportation sector alone. And that because our energy grid in Ontario was already extremely green, switching to an electric vehicle was certainly a way that we could make a difference. Electricity is also about five times cheaper than gasoline to drive the same distance. So with me commuting back and forth between Burlington and Toronto every day, it really made a lot of financial sense too. But little did we know that the path that we were about to take by making that first big change in going electric. We met a lot of like-minded individuals and one couple that we met were leaders of Al Gore's Climate Reality Project as well. Dr. Joyce Lee and her husband, Dr. Jeremy Thiel. We attended several of their lectures and as physicians, they really connected the dots between the severity of the climate crisis, how it affects our health and mortality, and also how it disproportionately impacts society's most vulnerable people. So we were convinced and we knew that we had to be part of this solution and, and we had to take action to try to lead by example too. So in the months that passed, we started making small changes at home. We focused on consumption and cut out single use products. We bought a couple of high quality coffee tumblers, aluminum water bottles, and have made a point never to buy plastic bottled water since. We started eating less meat, eventually cutting out red meat entirely. I've recently gone vegan, um, and we're also trying to reduce our overall food waste. Uh, we use a company called Bullfrog Power to buy carbon offsets for our other gas powered vehicle. We spoke with our financial planner and divested from funds that supported fossil fuel investment and development. We started shopping more sustainably as well, going to farmers markets for local produce, where we started refilling bottled products like soaps and shampoo at the refillery. And we even found some eco-focused stores like a greener place in Waterdown. But it didn't feel like enough, and we didn't feel properly equipped to take things to the level that we knew they needed to be we realized that we had to learn more about it. So a climate reality training event was coming up in August of 2019, and we felt that this was our opportunity. So we enrolled and both were accepted to attend three days of intense training in Minneapolis, led by Al Gore himself, along with dozens of climate scientists and other experts. The knowledge that we gained from climate reality empowered us to make bigger changes and take greater action. But most importantly, it gave us the confidence to approach leaders in business and government and ask them to make big changes as well. And as we learned more, we acted more. And we soon developed a credible voice on the subject. We scheduled our first presentation in late September at Tansley Woods Community Centre for our friends, families and neighbours. Everyone was very interested in what we've been up to, and I hope it made a real impact on everyone at the event. Since then, we presented on numerous occasions to various groups within our community, including as guest speakers at our church for Outreach Sunday. Uh, we also joined Lead Now and interviewed MP candidates prior to last fall's election. Our, our goal with Lead Now was to help find and support climate champions who both acknowledged and vowed to support political action to address the climate crisis. We now volunteer with Citizens Climate Lobby as well. CCL is a nonpartisan group who meets with politicians to discuss having the most effective carbon pricing to meet Canada's commitments in the Paris Agreement. We attended the federal leaders debate for our North Burlington riding and submitted, submitted questions about environmental policy. We also attended meetings held by the city of Burlington while they were developing their climate action plan and provided feedback to the consultants who were helping to shape the plan. And we also scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings with our ward counselor to further convey our concerns and support for their plan. We attended a global climate strike event on Friday, September 20th, held here in Burlington. And then again, the following Friday, September 27th in Toronto. And this is a view from a news helicopter at Queens Park of that event. It was estimated that over 15,000 people took place in Toronto and actually over 6 million worldwide. And Melissa went to the offices of three political leaders to ask them to reject the tech frontier mine. 
We had the privilege of meeting and attending a lecture by Canadian climate scientist, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who was also named the UN's Climate Champion of the Year and one of our new heroes. Paul joined the green team of the property management group CBRE in the office buildings where he works. He advocated for waste reduction, carpool programs, and electrical, electric vehicle charging across the Three Tower facility. Paul also registered to speak as a delegate in front of Burlington City Council to support uh, the city's climate action plan after it was presented to council. We participated in a TD Bank sponsored tree planting event at Lowville, Lowville Park run by our friend Scott Kirby, who's a fellow climate uh, Burlington climate reality leader. Our family recently participated in Burlington's cleanup event by picking up several bags of trash in the ravine that runs behind our house. And finally, we supported and promoted the recent shoe strike put on by Burlington Greens Youth Network and Students for Change Halton. So this is just the two of us with demanding jobs, three young kids, and all within the last 14 months. And to be honest, the surprising thing was how easy it all was. Once motivated, it actually became kind of addictive. And we plan to keep this momentum going by engaging ourselves further as members of Citizens Climate Lobby. Melissa will actually be assisting the Oakville CCL leader and looking to expand the Oakville Burlington chapter as well. We also plan on looking further into green improvements on our home, such as making better use of our yard, uh, expanding our vegetable gardens, installing a heat pump, and eventually solar panels once the renewable energy cooperative starts to take shape. The key is to combine personal changes with pushing for more policy changes and at the same time encouraging others to do the same. Our hope is that if others realize what can be done, then more people will be inclined to act and the better our chances will be that we can start to turn things around within our lifetime for our children and their generations to follow. So we will end with a quote that really stood out and inspired us and it says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So thank you. Wow, <clears throat> that was incredible. Thank you so much uh, to both Paul and Melissa uh, for joining us this evening and sharing their very personal climate story. Personally, uh, it's an incredible inspiration and just wanted to thank you both for all that you've done and are doing to benefit the community and the environment. I really love how you talked about um, the process being addicting and how it can turn from starting to be a little bit overwhelming when you're beginning your journey, but as you're beginning to take these actions, uh, getting more and more excited about it and recognizing how much uh, power and influence we can have as individuals. Um, so thank you so much again for that beautiful and inspiring presentation. And now to hear from our final presenter this evening, Amy Schnur. Here is a video clip capturing what inspires her longtime efforts to help the planet locally. I'm inspired to take action on climate change locally for at least three key reasons. The first is my children. As a mom, I feel it's very important to do what I can when I can, to live by example, and to demonstrate as a family how we can live more softly on this earth. Secondly, I'm inspired to take action on climate because of nature. I'm continually and increasingly in awe of its beauty, of its boundless gifts that it provides us, of its fragility and its resiliency. And by taking personal action on climate change, it's a way that I can support and give back to the natural world of which we all depend on. And thirdly, I'm inspired to take action on climate because of the future. I think about how it's incumbent on all of us as humanity living on Mother Earth today to do everything we can to take bold, effective, immediate action on climate change so that future generations are afforded the opportunity to live on a beautiful, healthy, and livable planet to call their home. After all, there is no planet B. Thanks so much, Kale, and good evening, everybody. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm, st I'm still thinking about everything that uh, Paul and Melissa that you just shared. 
Uh, it's probably my favorite part of being privileged to uh, be in this role at Burlington Green to meet folks like yourself. So I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, not only for joining us this evening, but for all that you do every day. It's really tremendous. At any rate, we're in the home stretch of this evening's presentation. And uh, during my quick turn at the mic, I'd like to briefly highlight some of the top climate action tips and share a little bit more about Burlington Green and how you can involve with us. And as Kale mentioned, I have a little bit of exciting news to share as well. So in regards to uh, climate action tips, we've got eight here for you. And uh, we know that like the Fletcher, some of you are already actively doing some or many of these, and maybe for some of you, you're just getting started. Uh, and that's entirely okay. Just climb aboard, join us on this green journey. And certainly, well, mo the most impactful actions we can all take to drive down our greenhouse gas emissions here in Burlington um, has to do with energy, with transportation and buildings. We absolutely can't afford to leave any opportunity uh, out of the solutions mix. For example, natural solutions to tackle uh, climate change are also beneficial as we've learned tonight. And what we're finding here at Burlington Green is we're learning more about folks during COVID who for the first time are spending more, more time in nature and they're appreciating and they're caring for nature. So, you know, all of us protecting and restoring habitat, naturalizing green space, holding on to the mature trees that we have left and planting more. All of these things are really valuable in allowing us to sequester more carbon and um, you know, it makes us all healthier and it beautifies Burlington at the same time. I think the point is that we just want to do as much as we can, when we can with purpose, like Paul and um, Melissa said, you know, with commitment and a good measure of hope over fear and together we can rise to the challenge and really accelerate action on climate right here at home. And the good news is guys, is you're not in this alone. We're here to help. That's what Burlington Green is all about. You know, we got started back in 2007, a handful of visionary residents hit the ground running, recognizing we got to get rolling on this. We got to get the community mobilized to help make positive and sustainable change happen right here in Burlington. And right from the get-go, um, we adopted what we call a triple A approach. And it's through awareness, advocacy and action that we collaborate with everybody in the community, all sectors to protect nature and mitigate climate change and help to create a healthier, more environmentally responsible Burlington. So I'd like to just touch briefly on each of the A's to get, a, get you a better feel for what we have to offer. And tonight's event is just, you know, one of many opportunities we organize. Um, you know, and again, some of them are in workshop format or sm smaller scale presentations. But we've also been thrilled to bring hundreds of uh, folks together, filling venues with special guest presenters, such as Dr. Jane Goodall, um, our dear friend Rob Stewart that we miss so terribly, and uh, David Su Suzuki, to name a few. And we've certainly helped thousands of children grow up green, and we've provided lots and lots of youth with rewarding skill building opportunities. And I encourage all of you, if you haven't already checked out our EcoScore quiz, it's just a handy brief quiz on our website and it helps you discover where you're at on the green journey and um, it has some helpful tips that are locally focused so that you can look at how you can uh, further reduce your environmental impact. And um, advocacy is our second pillar of work. And with amazing participation, I know Jane's on this call, Scott, some other folks are wonderful volunteers that join us in speaking up on truth to power. We invite the community to do that with us. And so far we've already championed 130 issues uh, here in Burlington. And, and it would be remiss in not pointing out to everybody on the call tonight that, you know, our politicians expect to hear from us at Burlington Green. And it's even more impactful when you, when you folks, you constituents speak up directly, you know, letting our leaders know that action on climate and a healthy environment are critical issues that really matter to you. Um, and that you expect them to prioritize and demonstrate leadership consistently on this. And certainly right now, 
you know, we've witnessed with COVID and the crisis with that, that all levels of government, they can come together with urgency and they can dedicate the resources. And, you know, we need that same speed and scale and nonpartisan commitment to tackle this climate emergency. You know, we have the opportunity to protect species and create a healthier environment. We can build an economy and society that's stronger, more just and more resilient than we had before the COVID crisis began. You know, there's, there's never a shortage of important issues to speak up on. And so I encourage all of you to get involved and just keep in mind, you know, no effort is too small. And the more voices that unite together, you know, we're going to have a way better chance of realizing a livable planet, not only for us, but, you know, for those yet to come for the future. And finally, the third A, of course, is action. And we invite you to get involved in those too. It was wonderful to see Paul and Melissa and Scott and their kids. What a great way to get them to grow up green by having them participate in our Clean Up Green Up. This year was our 10th year anniversary doing that. And we had to put a twist on it because of COVID. But you know, whether it's growing and donating local produce to support community members in need or helping people make the switch to low or no carbon ways to get around, you know, we've, oh, I don't even know, Kale, I can't remember how many events and festivals in the city we've got volunteers uh, to join us in diverting mountains, literally mountains of waste from going to the landfill. You know, we're cleaning and greening up our communities, you know, whatever it takes, it's really, you know, mobilizing the community to make an immediate tangible difference we found to be really key in creating a healthy, uh, more resilient Burlington. So whether it's awareness or advocacy or action opportunities or all three combined, I hope you can see that we've got lots uh, on the go to help you help the planet locally. And we're so grateful to so many people in the community who continue to join us in these impactful efforts. And we'd love you to join us too. Um, so I did mention before I pass this mic over, I have a little bit of news to share. Um, and that is that we are inviting all of you to join us in establishing a community climate hub right here in Burlington. You know, hubs are awesome because they help unify voices, you know, so we can have a shared vision at the local level. Um, you know, having diverse voices coming together can really be effective in growing support for stronger political action on climate change. Um, so during the next few months, we're going to get the ball rolling over here at BG so we can get ready to officially launch the hub in early 2021. And we won't be doing it alone. As I said, the goal here is to, you know, develop and support a really authentically community driven um, movement. Um, so we'll be inviting all of you on this call tonight to participate. In fact, some of you may even be keen to be founding members of this new hub. And, you know, we want to visualize or envision and develop what that could look like. It, we expect it would be, you know, a regular meetup space. Uh, initially virtually during COVID and we'll have resources to share. Um, we're going to want to measure how the city and the community are progressing on climate action. We'll have resident driven campaigns, a Burlington climate action pledge, lots of great stuff. So stay tuned to learn more about this by signing up if you haven't already to receive our monthly newsletter. Um, and I just want to thank you all so, so much for your time and attention and Guess what's up next? Tick tock, tick tock, poll time. Here we go. Kelly, if you'd like to launch the poll, we can begin uh, making your selections on this one. And this time around, folks, you get to pick your top three. I'll give you a little bit longer on this one because there's more to choose from. Okay. So we're asking which are the three you want to do? You might want to start or you might want to do more of. I love this. This is so interesting. Okay. I'm going to give it uh, five more seconds. Looks like it's slowing down. 
five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, everybody check this out. This is so interesting. So looks like a tiebreaker between eating locally grown plant-based foods right on and consuming and wasting less, which is great. And right behind that is caring for nature. But you know what's so neat is um, there's something for everybody there. So everybody's is a good mix of opportunities where uh, everybody would like to get started or do more uh, action on these things. So thanks so much everybody for doing the poll. Okay, um, and you know what, just before I pass it over um, to Kale, um, I just want to quickly mention, um, oh shoot, sorry, I just lost my spot here, guys. Uh, anyway, uh, you, you saw on that list there, where is it? Divest from fossil fuels and invest in renewables. Let's see, 17% of you are interested in that, which is a, um, great thing because we are going to be co-hosting a um, event and it's going to be on November 12th and we're partnering up with Edward Jones Investments to um, host this event and it's all about ethical and earth-friendly investing. So I uh, really encourage you to check that one out and as Kale said right at the get-go, no worries, we will send you a link um, with what that one is all about. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back to Kale, who's gonna share an important message from local youth before we move on to the discussion and Q&A session of tonight. Thanks, everybody. Amazing, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention that the two highest results on our last poll, eating locally grown plant-based foods and consuming less and waste less, I feel like you guys are flirting with me. Those are my two favorite things um, at all. So great job. And, um, you know, eating plants can be really fun and making less garbage is also great. So it's a bit of a full circle moment for me to have the honor of saying a few words about the importance of recognizing youth leadership in the climate change movement as I started with Burlington Green as our first ever youth program coordinator when I was still a teenager. I actually started my environmental journey as a co-op student, volunteering with Burlington Green and starting the city's first environmentally focused youth network. It has now been more than a decade that I've been continually inspired by the many young people in Burlington who have actively demonstrated their commitment to cleaning up our generation's messes and creating a better world. It is an honor to introduce this video and to share with you guys what a few of them have had to say about climate change. My name is Julia, I go to Emma Robinson High School, I'm in grade 11 and I believe in climate action. My name is Christian. I'm Ankita. And I'm Callie. We're in grade 11 at Robert Bateman, and we, we demand, demand climate action. My name is Ariba Aleem. I am a grade 9 student at Burlington Central High School. I am asking Burlington to take climate action. My name is Harrison. I'm Kat. I'm Emma. We're from grade 10 at Burlington Central High School, and, and we, we support, support climate, climate action. action. I'm Heidi. I'm in grade 11 at Robert Bateman High School, and I demand climate action. Hi, my name is Peyton, and I'm 11 years old. Hi, my name is Heather, and I'm 11 years old. Hi, my name is Lynn, and I'm 7 years old. And, and we, we demand climate action now! Amazing. Thanks to all of those students who have decided to share their message with us. And now it's time to hear from you. I would like to welcome team member Sue, who manages our fundraising and donor engagement. Sue is going to open up the call for a brief discussion and Q&A. But first, let's see her video clip. I grew up in a family that lived simply, spent a lot of time in nature and volunteered to help others. 
And I've learned that each of us is connected to nature and to everyone else in the world. I think about the things that we use every day, like my computer, books, clothes, food, and how many people everywhere in the world have been connected to those objects. I've learned that I can make a difference when things aren't right. And I believe that all those people deserve a fair chance to be safe and healthy. I'm working to change our systems so that we can all live together like a global family that cooperates with nature so that every member of our family, including the children everywhere in the world, have a fair chance to live healthy and safe. Hi everybody. So um, I just really loved watching those messages from the youth. It's so important to support them and learn from them and to listen to what they're telling us. They, they really are leading the way. So I'm glad we included that tonight. And uh, now it's time for discussion amongst the, amongst the group. And I'm going to let you know that there's a couple of ways you can ask a question. You can type a message uh, in the chat box and you can direct it to everybody if you want, um, or you can uh, direct it to, um, to Marwa or to me um, as co-hosts and we can um, we keep track of that. Or if you want to, um, if you want to um, be able to speak to the group, you can, um, if you put a message in the chat that just writes star, star, hand up here, I'll do a little sample here starts their hand up, um, then hopefully we'll notice it and we can keep track of the order in which um, people have uh, raised their hands to, to share a point or to ask a question. And, uh, and then um, when we call on you, we, uh, you, can, you can share your thoughts. So um, I'm gonna ask our folks who are presenting today to turn on your cameras. And um, if you're gonna answer a question, there's Amy, there's Kale, Marwa. Uh, if, if you're gonna answer a question, uh, we can get you unmuted, but for now, let's just have the cameras on. And I'm checking in our chat to see if anybody has a question. Um, don't see anything, no pressure, but we'd love to hear from folks. And even if you just wanna type an observation or something, um, something you want to share with the group that's um that's great um i have a question for kale um which is about um opportunities for youth in burlington kale because um with uh with covid happening and a lot of um activities for the students um not going forward uh, what's what's available now for youth to do as volunteers connected to Burlington Green? What are, what are, what are the opportunities that are available now? Yeah, a very good question. And obviously with COVID, we've shifted and adjusted quite a few of our um, events, but we just did um, a shoe strike, which you saw or heard of in Paul and Melissa's presentation. So that was like an in-person event that we were able to plan and organize completely digitally and then have just a few of us present socially distant. So we meet weekly once every Monday uh, at 4.30 p.m. on Zoom. And we've been doing that since uh, I would say about April since we've transitioned into COVID and have done a whole bunch of really excellent stuff around pollinators and we're working on textile waste right now. So we have weekly drop-in meetings and we organize digital events, but also some in-person stuff if we're able to do it physically distant. And then one of the great things about coming to those weekly meetings or even staying on our mailing list and getting updated about them is we present all of the upcoming volunteer opportunities that are available um, whenever they do pop up. Aha, uh -huh. oh, that's great. Um, did you say how many were at the shoe strike, Kale? Uh, I did not, but that's a very good question. So we were able to collect 232 pairs of shoes, uh, which each represent an individual being present at the shoe strike, but obviously not present due to uh, the COVID restrictions. So yeah, a small group of us, of students with a few different organizations were able to 
uh, create an event where 232 people were able to have their voices heard. So it was very successful and yeah, super well received. And it was lots of fun to organize too. So to be able to go through the process of finding an issue we're passionate about, um, organizing a campaign around it, it's a great way to get volunteer hours, experience in uh, event planning, campaign planning, organization. And uh, it's lots of fun and you make cool friends too. Oh yeah, that's really great. I I, I attended one of the um, one of the youth uh, network meetings. It was really fun. They were making bee hotels. <laughs> I yeah. love that. That was really. That was it's really as fun. dramatic and wonderful as you could imagine. So there's a question, um, Kale. There's a question actually uh, from Ben. What is a shoe strike? That's Very good, good question. question. Yeah. So if you can imagine sort of the visuals, you've probably seen them where instead of a physical demonstration of having humans stand there with like our signs to uh, demonstrate our care and passion for an issue, uh, our presence was felt by the laying out and distribution of shoes that represented the people. So it's just like a physical demonstration, like the Greta uh, Thunberg climate strikes that were happening all over the planet, but with shoes as uh, in comparison to the people. And another sweet bonus mm -hmm. is we were able to donate about mm -hmm. 200 pairs of shoes to the Halton Compassion Society at the end of our demonstration. So it was good for the environment on many different levels. Yeah, so the shoes will not be in the landfill. They'll be used by people who can really need them. That is wonderful. So I have an announcement from, uh, so uh, one of our group, Arlene has just um, chatted me directly to say that she just heard that Enbridge is withdrawing their application to run a new fracked gas pipeline across rural Hamilton. All those petitions we sign and letters we write do have an impact, says Arlene. That is great. Wow. Just letting that sink in. Okay. So maybe people I've seen in the chat, there's a question from Jane. So I'm going to um, read that out. And our panelists hopefully have had a chance to take a look and um, have some ideas about how to respond to this. So Jane is asking, she says, I'd be interested to know whether folks on this webinar are aware of the fact that the current provincial government's energy policy will drive carbon emissions in Ontario up by 300% and increase the cost of electricity for all of us. So um, I don't know uh, if people in the, it, I mean, we can, in the chat, people can just say, I, yes, I knew, or no, I didn't know, I guess. Jane, you wanna know if everybody attending uh, is aware of this? Or maybe Jane just wants yeah, us all uh, to know. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Do you oh, want to, okay. <laughs> okay. You can turn your camera on too if you want us to see oh, you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Whoops. Um, it says the host has stopped my video. Oh, okay. Someone has to, someone will, will, will let, doesn't, turn on doesn't your video. Matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, okay. There we go. There we are. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, one of the things we talked about is getting involved and finding out about things. And I was really interested to hear the Fletchers say they had joined LEAD now because I'm involved with that organization somewhat myself. And there's all kinds of ones like that. And I found out about this um, increase in carbon emissions uh, from, I think it was the Atmospheric Fund or one of those anyway. And um, I took action by volunteering to distribute postcards this summer that provided this information to householders in my neighborhood. And I don't think a lot of people realize that because the government is refurbishing two nuclear reactors, nuclear um, power generating stations, and taking them offline, and, and against all the recommendations of, of experts who say they should be mothballed, then um, during that time they're building a number of gas-fired power generation plants to offset the loss of power generation from the two nuclear stations. Um, and this is going to add 300% plus carbon emission to Ontario while all that's going on over a number of years. And it's also going to make uh, energy more ex expensive for us, uh, electricity. 
And all of this time, we could be striking a deal with Quebec to get cheap hydroelectric power. Um, and all we need to do is make an investment in um, expanding our, our transmission system so that we can get that power from Quebec to Ontario. And that would be much less costly in the long run than what this actual government is doing. So this is an example of the kind of thing that kind of gets snuck in. Um, but if you are tied into organizations like Lead Now, and there's a number of others, um, some of us is another one, um, you can find out about this stuff and you can sign all kinds of petitions. I must sign two or three petitions at least every day. And that's a very efficient way of you um, raising your voice politically. And a lot of those petitions are copied to your local MP or MPP as well. Um, so I guess it was not really me asking a question. Uh, yes, I, I am interested to know whether people actually did know about this. Um, but I just wanted to give it as an example of the kind of ways that people can become engaged, even if they don't have lots and lots of time, they can, they can find their political voice by piggybacking on some of these organizations um, who have done all the research and um, are able to put something together that you can simply, you know, click and sign and get your voice heard. So that was just something I wanted to raise for, for folks tonight. Thank you, Jane. Thanks for sharing that. Is that um, our petitions for that something that Burlington Green? I don't know that we have that on our on our advocacy site right now for that particular issue, but we do have a number of advocacy um, issues that are highlighted on, on our on our page now. Did anybody want to talk about that from our team? I think um, Amy here, I think Jane did a tremendous job at um, sharing what that's all about. I do think we have it um, on our Speak Up uh, web page, but uh, really to Jane's point, I just want to, I think you just said it beautifully, Jane, is, is we need, to, there's so many issues, there seems to be a lot sneaking in. And uh, obviously people are really um, focused on COVID and maybe aren't as aware of some of the things that are happening um, by the provincial government. So it's important we pay attention and and speak up. And as um, Jane said, there's some quick and easy ways that you can do so. Thanks again so much, Jane, for sharing that. No problem. My pleasure. Great. Well, there's a couple um, comments in the in the chat as well. Um, Lynn Robichaux put in uh, put in a link to find in more information. Clean cleanairalliance.org/gas-hyphen phase out. Um, so if you can see the um, if you can see the chat, you can you can catch that there. And um, well, I don't see any other questions, and we're um, we're rounding up on eight thirty. So I want to thank everybody who's oh, sorry. Um, who's sorry to brought forward you. a suggestion or discussion item, and uh, and uh, our great discussion amongst our um, our group tonight. And uh, we're going to move on now and. Amy, I think you can go ahead because I think, um, oh, I think Sue is having some connectivity. Oh, Sue's mute. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. I don't want to interrupt, but um, thank you, Lynn. Lynn also posted a uh, friendly reminder about um, right now, uh, people are invited to go to the Burlington's um, Get Involved Burlington.ca IMP site to complete the survey. So some of us participated last week in a really good discussion with some terrific um, speakers, including um, Diane Sachs, the former Environment Commissioner of Ontario. And right now the City of Burlington wants to gather your input on uh, different ways to get around Burlington and how to have those integrated. So like we all learned tonight, transportation, Burlington Green, or Burlington has a bad stat and we wanna change. We have the highest car ownership in Burlington. So we need to really figure this out. So encourage everybody to um, go. Uh, and we'll include that link maybe in our email, you guys, after the fact, so people can go and um, fill out the survey. 
I haven't actually filled it out yet, but I think Marwa did, which is super. Uh, anyway, just wanted to mention that. Thanks, Lynn, for bringing it to our attention. Okay, so thanks, Amy, for jumping in when I got I got cut off, booted off the call, but now I'm back and uh, time to. So as I was saying, we're gonna flip over. I think we're ready, right? To, I jumped the gun uh, before, but uh, yeah. So I'm ready for Kale's closing comments and the poll for winning an e-card from Park Market and Refillery, and we're gonna contact the winner after tonight's meeting. So here's Kale. Hi, it's me, <clears throat> Kale. So I uh, have the pleasure of summarizing uh, all of the information we absorbed this evening, knowing that there was a lot, and also knowing that anything that you missed today is going to be sent out in a nice user-friendly format via email after this event. So we want to make sure that we have a nice summary at the end so everyone leaves feeling hopeful and inspired and knows what to do. The number one thing that we would recommend after today's event is to stay connected with Burlington Green. And it's very, very easy for you to do that. We are on pretty much any social media platform you can find. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and you can also sign up right on our webpage on burlingtongreen.org to join us on our mailing list. And one of the reasons I think that all of that is so important is because there's a lot of environmental issues happening and Burlington Green tries very hard to present that information in a nice user-friendly format. And you heard us talk tonight about awareness, advocacy, action, and it's just nice to have all of those things presented to you in a nice user-friendly format. So if you're not already connected, please make sure that you find a way to connect with Burlington Green and stay connected after this evening's event. Number two is to visit our website for helpful resources, tips, and to learn your eco score. So we have a robust website with lots of different, um, like I said, resources uh, that will be helpful along your journey, tips, and the eco score is a really, really great place to start. And it's a great resource to send to friends as well because it's a dynamically produced survey uh, that makes people think about some of their environmental impacts in ways they might not typically. Number three is we have been a registered charity for about a year and a half now. If you are able to make a donation of any amount, you'll be powering change right here in Burlington. We put every dollar we receive to work right here to benefit the community and the health of the environment. We will be providing a link to our donation portal in a follow-up email, so if you're so inclined, a big thanks to everyone who has already so generously supported our work. We are very, very grateful. The last tip that we'd like to give to everyone is to participate. So continue participating in events like these. For example, our friend Grant Linney, who is a presenter extraordinaire, is reprising his highly successful public webinar entitled Climate Change, How to Avoid Catastrophic Inaction Through Science-Based Solutions and Prioritize Political Action, which takes place next Tuesday, October 27th in the evening. Again, we invite you to register for, to participate in the Ethical and Earth-Friendly Investing event on November 12th that we are co-hosting. We'll share the links in the follow-up email that you guys will all receive. Now, it is time for our final poll. By completing this poll, you'll be entered into a draw for a chance to win an e-card from the Park Market and Refillery. The winner will be contacted after this event. You will see that this poll has three separate questions and we kindly ask you to answer all three. Kelly, can you please launch our poll? Honest feedback is gratefully appreciated. Our team here at Burlington Green works very hard to provide the best and most impactful event experiences. So anything that you have to share and um, of course your honest feedback is very, very much appreciated. And make sure you scroll down to see the entire poll. There's three different questions. I'll give you guys about um, 10 more seconds. Okay, 
Fantastic. And thanks for everyone who has stayed uh, right until the end uh, to finish this poll. We'll give you guys a few more seconds, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of you guys for showing up this evening, especially on a topic uh, like climate change, which I'm sure we're aware can be um, easy or enticing to sort of hide our gaze from. So the fact that we are looking directly at the problem and looking for solutions, we are so, 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 so grateful for all of you guys choosing to spend your time with us this evening. And once you have finished the poll, um, yes, you are, uh, are free to leave. And we just wanted to uh, make sure that we share our deep appreciation for your presence. So thanks so much for joining us this evening for local stories, local solutions with Burlington Green and the Fletchers.